just to kind of introduce you to Brian Crane. Uh, we've known uh, Brian and Diana personally for about 23 years now. It's been a, a great relationship. They used to live around the corner from us. Their kids were about the same age as our kids, and so, uh, you know, it's either they were over at our house or we were over at their house. And uh, Brian, when he started this uh, comic strip, it immediately took root. People love Earl and uh, what's her name? <laughs> How many know her name? Oh, everybody knows Opal. Okay. How many of you read pickles every day? <laughs> How many of you would quit taking the paper if they stopped publishing pickles? <laughs> All right. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great hit right from the start. Uh, Brian has been honored locally for uh, the quality of uh, cartoon strip. Uh, he's received national recognition. He's uh, been noted as the newspaper comic strip of the year by the National uh, uh, Cartoonist Society. Uh, all of that is great, but uh, what we especially like about him is that he's just a great person. Uh, we had a, a, a son who was kind of struggling in school, thought he might want to be a, an artist and a cartoonist. Brian invited him into his studio every day after school. He came in and uh, he helped uh, our son uh, actually send off a comic strip to some of the publishers and he got some really nice rejection letters. <laughs> <laughs> but some of them were encouraging. Uh, but he still does that. Uh, just talking to him the other day, I discovered that um, he's looking at some young artists' uh, work and giving them pointers and, and helping them uh, with what they're trying to accomplish in their lives as well. So he's a great guy, wonderful friend, and, uh, and you'll enjoy hearing from Brian Crane. Uh, in lieu of a, of a, a, speaker's, uh, a speaker's fee, uh, we ask if he would like to uh, promote his most recent book. So if you're interested in purchasing his most recent book, he'll be available to autograph that, and they've, they've got some set up at the table in the back. Uh, they're never disappointing. I don't know how many of you have purchased his books in the past, but they're never disappointing. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Brian to come up and uh, get his... There we go. Uh, you know, when I was growing up as a young boy dreaming about doing a comic strip, somehow that dream never included talking to groups of people like this. <laughs> it, it wasn't uh, part of my wish, but it kind of came with a job. Uh, and uh, I've gotten so, so I enjoy it, uh, to some degree anyway. I'm, I'm kind of a shy guy, but, uh, but it's nice to, uh, to see people who enjoy my work and, and uh, get a little feedback and, and see uh, what I'm doing right or what I'm doing wrong. Um, well, I've been doing this for, for uh, gee, since 1990. I can't believe it. You know, of all the different types of artists there are, uh, I think the comic strip artist is one of the hardest working artists there are because how many different artists are required to create a new uh, original piece of artwork every single day of their lives. <laughs> it gets, uh, it can be uh, draining. I can see why some cartoonists, after a few years, just uh, hang, hang up their uh, their drawing board and, and uh, try something else because it, it it's hard to come up with new, fresh ideas and not get stale and and uh, out of touch. But uh, I still love doing it. It's it's still a, uh, can be a grind, but uh, I, I love doing it. And when I hear from people like you who say that. Uh, Oh, it makes my day. I can't start the day without it. It, it just really gives me a charge and makes me want to keep doing it uh, as long as I can. Well, it's a uh, question I get asked most often is, why is it called Pickles? <laughs> and I don't know if I have a good answer for it. It, it. I never intended that to be the name of the strip, really. Uh, I read Charles Schultz's biography. He wanted to call his strip Little Folks. And the syndicate said, no, we don't like that. Uh, we want to call it Peanuts. And Charles Schultz always hated peanuts. So uh, I think that's a much better title than Little Folks myself. But, uh, but he, he didn't like it. And I, or maybe he just didn't like being told what it had to be. But he had to, do, he had to go along with the syndicate. 
So when I it came to think of a name for my strip, I, said, I figured, well, I'll, I'll call it Pickles, and they'll change it to something good. <laughs> but they never did. So <laughs> but by way of some explanation, uh, it also applies to the characters. Their last name uh, is Pickles. It's Earl and Opal Pickles. Uh, and uh, it also kind of refers to the situations they get into, you know, getting into a pickle, which they do a lot of. Not to be confused with getting pickled, which is a, a different uh, connotation entirely. These are the characters there. Uh, Brad, if you hear, this is Opal, O-P-A-L. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> I know, I get brain freeze sometimes, too. But, uh, you know, when I was thinking of what I wanted to do a comic about, that's a big decision for a cartoonist because if you're at all successful, you could possibly be writing about these same characters for the rest of your life. I mean, Charles Schultz wrote about Charlie Brown and Snoopy and, and uh, all the rest of them for 50 years. That's a long time to write about one set of characters. I mean, a novelist can switch characters, you know, every few books, you know. But a cartoonist, you have to be very, you have to feel a real connection to these characters so that you can you can mine them for ideas. They, you can be inspired by them for, for decades, hopefully. And so I drew a lot of different characters in a sketchbook trying to think of what do I want to draw? What kind of people do I want to write about? And it wasn't until I drew this, this uh, older man and woman that really I felt a real connection to them. They reminded me of people I knew in my family, and, and, uh, and I just wanted to know more about them. They just intrigued me. And I, I've, I've always loved being around people older than myself. Um, and uh, so I feel right at home here today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> no, you know, when I used to go speak at places like this, people would see me and think, and I heard someone today say it, that, oh, we thought you'd, we didn't, you know, at all of what we expected, we thought you'd be a much older man. I used to get that a lot, but now I hardly ever get it. But <laughs> so whoever said that today, I really appreciate that. It gave me a real boost. <laughs> uh, here's my characters, Earl and Opal, uh, toasting uh, their anniversary with a uh, nice uh, glass of uh, Metamucil. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I write about getting older a lot. And, uh, you know, we look forward to old age. Hopefully that it'll be the golden years, and, and as the poem says, uh, the best is yet to be. Hopefully that's the case. We hope that, uh, that our health will hold out, our, our money will hold out, our, you know, our, all those good things will go along with it. Sometimes the, uh, you know, it's not as, you know, things come up and it's not as rosy as we hoped it would be. Sometimes uh, reality sets in. Th these are uh, a couple that won a Earl and Opal look-alike contest a few years ago. <laughs> I think it's amazing. It's kind of st it kind of startles me to see them in real life, though, you know, because <laughs> I don't draw in all the uh, the age spots and wrinkles, you know. And so to, to see real live characters there uh, makes me know why there probably will never be a live-action movie of the Pickles, <laughs> you know. But uh, they were a sweet couple. They actually, they're not married, but uh, but they look like they they belong on a comic strip. That's for sure. Someone else thought that they all should look like uh, Wilfred Brimley. I think there's, <laughs> there's a good resemblance there. Well, you know, uh, some days you're the dog, some days you're the fire hydrant. <laughs> some days you're the bug, some days you're the windshield. What I do in my comic strip is write, I write about the little foibles that happen to us all, you know, the things that, uh, that go wrong, the, the, the silliness. We live in a world where there's a lot of serious people there's a lot of terminally silly, serious people, especially in election years, you know, everyone's really serious. <laughs> and uh, what, I, what I try to do is, is look for the, 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 the fun things, the humorous things in life and, uh, that happen to all of us. I think, I think humor is so important. It's like, you know, you need to take seriously the things that, that should be taken seriously, but if we can't laugh at ourselves, and others too, <laughs> in a gentle way, I think that we're missing out on a on part of life, and uh, I don't think I don't think that we laugh enough. Uh, I used to I, I, I used to take walks. Well, I still take walks, but I used to, the where I used to live. I used to walk by a uh, a school, an elementary school, and if we and if we walked by there the right time of day, and the kids were out at recess, I mean it was noisy. They were laughing and screaming and yelling, 
on that same walk, I would come close to a, a retirement center. <laughs> it was quiet, <laughs> no one laughing. And I, I wondered, you know, what, what happens to us as we get older that we don't laugh as much? I read a survey that uh, the average child la laughs 400 times a day, and the average adult laughs 15 times a day. So uh, maybe we don't uh, stop laughing because we get older. Maybe we get older because we stop laughing. I don't know. But anyway, I, I tr that's what I try to do is try to find, look at life and, and, and observe people around me and, and find material that way. Because really, I'm not a very funny guy. Ask anyone who knows me. I'm, I'm just not a funny guy. I, I don't think of jokes. I don't tell jokes. I'm not the life of the party. But what I do is I observe people. I observe myself, my family, people I come in contact with. So every, every, anyone who knows me knows that anything they say could end up in the, in the newspaper. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I think uh, people, when they see it, oftentimes they say, you must have a camera in our house, because that's, that's what my wife or my husband does. And I think that's what I strive for. Poor Earl, he's, he has a hard time with both the cat and the dog, especially the cat. He's just not a cat person. Uh, but uh, I mentioned I get my ideas a lot, a lot of times from people around me. This, was, this actually happened to me. I was taking my walk. Uh, I take a long walk every morning and, and uh, used to have a dog and she would walk with me. One day I was walking through the park and after a long time I looked down and realized there was no dog in that leash. <laughs> she had slipped out without me noticing it and here I was walking along saying hello to people as I'm walking by and they're, they're looking at this guy walking his invisible dog <laughs> thinking oh, what uh, Looney Bin did he escape from. So. Uh, that was one of the cases where I could take something and, and almost literally put it in the comics pages. Sometimes I have to dramatize or exaggerate things when I make a comic strip, but sometimes they just happen right uh, before me and I, I'm uh, the character. Well, you know, uh, I've been invited here by, by uh, Brad and, and his company and deal with estate planning and planning for the future, so I thought I'd have a few, few strips that talk about those issues. You know, thinking about the future, here Earl and his grandson Nelson are talking about the future. Earl says, at my age, there are really only two questions. How much time do I have left, and what am I going to do with it? And why can't young people say a sentence without inserting the word like 15 times? <laughs> Nelson says, that's like three questions, Grandpa. Earl says, at my age, I can ask as many dang questions as I want. <laughs> Uh, another one, a wise man, Earl's quoting, he likes to quote uh, people, a wise man once said, the past is behind, learn from it. The future is ahead, prepare for it. The present is here, live for it. Opal comes up and says, a wise woman once said, dinner is ready, come and get it. <laughs> Nelson says, I like that one best. <laughs> Earl, he likes to, to impart uh, little bits of, of wisdom as he sees it to, to the grandson. Um, you ever read that book, uh, A Thousand Places to Go Before You Die? <laughs> uh, I got a copy of it and inspired a couple of strips here. What's that book you're reading, Earl? One Thousand Places to Go Before You Die. My daughter gave it to me. Apparently she thinks I'm going to die and she wants me to go somewhere else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> After this appeared, I got, a, I got uh, copies of this book in the mail, autographed by the author. She, she must have enjoyed it because she sent me a copies of her book. Here's one more in that same vein. What are you reading, Grandpa? It's a book called 1,000 Places to See Before You Die. It has all these places you should see before you die. The Taj Mahal, the Great Wall, the list goes on. How do they expect me to get to all these places? And if I don't, does it mean my life is a failure? I can't take this kind of pressure. Can an old man vegetate in peace? <laughs> I kind of felt that way when I was reading the book myself. And I, my wife's kind of like that. I like to travel, and she likes to stay home. So that's kind of where she comes in. Like I say, Earl likes to give little lessons. I call this one the parable of the pe pecan tree. You know, we like to uh, to uh, to leave something behind to benefit our, our our children, our grandchildren. Here, Earl's planting a tree for his grandson. Nelson says, "Are you planting a tree, Grandpa?" "Yep, it's a pecan tree. I'm actually planting it for you, for me." Yes, I'm going to all this trouble just for you. By the time this tree is mature enough to produce any pecans, I'll probably be dead and gone. But that's okay because you'll be here to enjoy the fruits of my labors. Nelson says, I don't like pecans. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. 
Isn't that how kids are? You, you do and you do and you do for them, and they just don't appreciate it sometimes. Well, sometimes he tries to, uh, to do things like this. Other times he just tries to help him with advice on how to cope with the problems in life. Here, and Nelson comes up and says, Grandpa, I've got a hole in my sock. And I don't know what's wrong with Earl there. He's, got a, he's lost his mustache, and he's got a few days' growth of beard. I guess he's having an identity crisis or something there. But uh, Earl says, I can fix that. I can fix that. What color is your sock? Green. And Nelson says, are you, are you looking for a needle and some green thread, Grandpa? And he says, nope, I'm looking for a green magic marker. <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, OK, where's that hole in your sock, Nelson? Right here. He uh, covers it up with the green marker. Wow, you're like a genius, Grandpa. <laughs> There's that word like again. Kids. <laughs> Let's see. Sometimes he gives advice on, on more serious matters, even spiritual things. Grandpa, can I ask you something? What is heck? What is heck? Uh-huh. Heck is where people go when they don't believe in gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of a cop-out of an answer there, isn't it? <laughs> Someone was talking to me earlier, back where I was signing books about, uh, why don't I let Nelson get older? You know, he, I've kind of frozen him in time. He's been the same age for years. Uh, he was actually based on my son, Jonathan, who was about this age, five or six, when I started the strip. Now the real Jonathan's taller than I am, but uh, Nelson has stayed the same age. And sometimes I kind of think it'd be kind of nice to do that with your, with your kids, because I mean, here they grow up like, uh, like the character in Zitz, you know? <laughs> and, and they say, uh, she says, sometimes I wish Nelson could stay the same age forever. Yeah, me too. That's not the way it works, though. I, I know. Someday he's going to be a teenager. Can you imagine that? And then they imagine him as, as Jeremy, the this, this character. And they're, well, look at the bright side. Maybe we'll be dead by then. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, ran this by the, the guys that do zits and made sure they were OK with it first before it ran. They, they loved it. They wanted the original for their office. So uh, they're really nice guys. But uh, you know, I don't, I don't uh, have my character's age. For one thing, if I let Earl and Opal be, get too much older, I'd be out of a job, you know. They're, <laughs> they're pushing the limits now. So, uh, plus, I like, the, uh, I like the, the, the naive nature of Nelson so that Earl can tell him anything, any, any kind of BS that he <laughs> wants to, and, and Nelson believes it, you know. I kind of like that element to it. And if he got a little bit older, he'd be wise to his, uh, to his malarkey. Well, occasionally, uh, you know, I, I had a guest uh, from a different strip up here in mine, from the Zit Strip. Occasionally, uh, my characters show up in other people's strips, and it's always kind of a surprise to see them. This, this one, he didn't run up by me before he did it. I just happened to see it. And there's Earl in the last, in the last panel. It's kind of, kind of fun to see how other characters uh, or other cartoonists imagine your characters. And you hope they're not funnier in his strip than they are, than they are in your strip. You know? <laughs> Here's another one from a strip called uh, One Big Happy. They're in the bottom there with uh, Roscoe. Yeah, they lost, lost a little weight in that one. I think they were a little bit heavier in my strip. But. Well, um, another, another issue that, uh, that, that seniors uh, face is, is, is how to plan e financially for the future. Uh, Earl's friend Clyde on the park bench there, I'm on the horns of a dilemma. About what? I can't decide if I should buy a new car or save the money for my children's inheritance. Do what I'm doing. Spend everything you got down to the last quarter before you go. And put that quarter in a gumball machine on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> I actually heard that quote from my, from my wife's parents. And, and, and uh, actually, they're just the opposite. They're, they're uh, saving every penny, but they thought it was funny. Well, you know, uh, speaking of finances, this is another experience that came from real life. My daughter. Uh, had ordered some um, new credit cards. And she saw that you could order special designs on them. So she thought, oh, it'd be fun to have a Hello Kitty design on my credit card. So she ordered the credit cards. When they came, she didn't realize this, but her husband's card also came with a Hello Kitty design <laughs> on it. <laughs> and, and so I said, I had to use this in the strip. And of course, that's uh, in the last panel, Opal says, I thought that might keep you from using it so much. So, <laughs> so if you want to keep your husband from uh, Spending so much with his credit card, get him a Hello Kitty <laughs> card. That might uh, do the <laughs> trick. Um, 
Another way to, to uh, plan for the future financially is to go with the uh, get rich quick scheme. Uh, here, Earl, he's got a, a tabletop. He spread cornflakes all over the tabletop. Opal says, what on earth are you doing, Earl? He says, I read about some lady who found a cornflake shaped like Illinois. She sold it on eBay for $1,350. I don't see why I couldn't do the same. All I have to do is find a flake shaped like a state and figure out what an eBay is. <laughs> <laughs> And Opal says, I see a flake shaped like my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I got this straight off the radio. I was listening to uh, NPR, and there was a, talked, uh, a news report about a lady who found a, a, uh, a cornflake shaped like Illinois and sold it for that amount of money. So <laughs> you can't make this, this stuff up sometimes. <clears throat> another, uh, well, you know, th another thing that uh, we deal with as we get older is, is our health. And we hope that our health will hold out and, and uh, we can keep on going strong. Earl says to Clyde there on the park bench, this economy has forced a lot of seniors into early retirement. There are a lot of guys out there, age 60 and over, who wish they were still working. Clyde says, I know I'm one of them. I wish my knees were still working. I wish my back were still working. I wish my eyes were still working. <laughs> Speaking of uh, your eyes working, uh, here they are at the, at the counter of the diner. Earl says, Opal, do you see that elderly couple down at the end of the counter? Yeah, what about them? I was just thinking, that's probably what you and I will look like in about 10 years or so. <laughs> she says, you do realize that's a mirror at the end of the counter, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I actually got this story from a friend of mine that actually happened to him, so. Uh, so. Well, another thing that uh, we have to worry about is our memory. You know, our notice we don't remember things as well. Here, Earl's walking down the street. Uh, Gets home, uh, sees his wife out by the mailbox, and she says, where you been, Earl? <laughs> oh, I went to the gas station to fill up the car. <laughs> Where is it? Where's what? The car. The car? Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Am I seeing some been there, done that nods up out there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, some of us uh, at a certain age have to go through certain medical procedures at times. Any of you who've had a uh, colonoscopy might be familiar with this one. I did this a few years ago and I got a lot of letters from, uh, from, from uh, colonoscopy doctors who wanted copies of this. Anyway, of course, Earl, he gets a, a doctor who thinks he's a magician, so he pulls a blanket out, a, a rabbit out from under the blanket and says, look what I found up there. <laughs> and Earl says, of all the gastroenterologists in the world, and I have to get one who thinks he's a magician. Well, I had, the, I had this procedure, I must admit, and that's where I got the ideas. And I, I noticed after the procedure, they give you actual snapshots of inside of your colon, don't they? Yeah. And you wonder, what am I supposed to do with these? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, I thought, well, what could Earl do with his? And I thought, well, knowing Earl, he'd probably put him in his Christmas newsletter. <laughs> and so I had, it, had him do that. He put him in his Christmas newsletter. I won't show you that, but after that appeared in the paper, I got a letter from a guy in Honolulu, and uh, here it, here's what he sent me. His Christmas newsletter with Christ <laughs> pictures of his, pictures of his uh, wonderful healthy colon there. <laughs> I try not to show this during dinner uh, speeches, though. It uh, tends to take away the appetite, but you know, you think you're thinking of something original, and here's somebody, he, he didn't do this after he saw my strip. He'd already done this be all on his own. He wasn't getting the idea from me. And I wonder, he looks like a normal guy, but gee, what's good? <laughs> <laughs> well, another thing that old folks deal with is a lot of free time on their hands. You know, I, I kind of feel uh, sorry for my wife. You know, I started working at home when I was in my 40s. And so she's had to put up with me for a lot longer than a lot of uh, spouses have to put up with a husband at home. And uh, of course, I'm always poking my nose into her business when she's doing things that wants me to just leave her alone. <laughs> but uh, Earl fills his time uh, you know, with his grandson a lot. Uh, here they are coloring together, and he says, Grandpa, how come you're always home? He says, so I can be with you, Nelson. My job is being your grandpa. Cool, does that mean I'm your boss? Uh, you'd better check with Grandma. She thinks that's her job. <laughs> It's kind of a you know it's kind of a, a lost feeling when you come home from from a, working at an office for a long time and you, you you do feel a little bit lost and like you know who's in charge here. <laughs> so he tries to be helpful. Uh, 
Opal brings the laundry, asks him to help fold the laundry, and uh, he pulls out a, one of uh, her un unmentionables and tries to, uh, <laughs> to figure out how to fold the darn thing. <laughs> uh, can't quite figure it out. It pops up, and he says, uh, he walks away. I just remembered I need to go rotate my tires or something. <laughs> <laughs> this actually happened to yours truly. So. <laughs> uh, you know, a, a few years ago, I was speaking to a, 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 a service group. I think it was the Lions Club. And they were mostly old guys, older than you guys. <laughs> and one old guy he had a plaid shirt and suspenders and a kind of grizzled whiskers. And, but he was showing off this, this, this atomic wristwatch he'd got for Christmas. His son had bought him and just bragging about how it never lost a, a nanosecond. It was so accurate. And so I did this strip of all about that. You know, it's, it's uh, calibrated by the by the radio signal of the National Atomic Clock in Boulder, Colorado, every every few minutes. And, and uh, anyway, so he's gone on and on. And then Earl says at the end, that's good to know. Heaven forbid you should be late for your 1130 squirrel feeding. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought when I saw this guy. What, is, what kind of schedule does he have? He has to have a, a watch that accurate. <laughs> Actually, I did get a letter or an email from the uh, director of the uh, National Atomic Clock in Boulder after this appeared. And he was, uh, he was happy to see it mentioned there. <laughs> well, so Opal thinks Earl should have a hobby, you know, to, to get him out of her hair. You need a hobby, Earl. He says, I've already got a hobby. I collect ceramic mustox figurines. Oh, yeah? How come I've never seen your collection? I haven't found any yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, after this appeared, you know, I, I picked that out, you know, when I was thinking, what kind of hobby, what would you collect that no one would ever have? I said, um, muskox figurines. Well, after this appeared, I started getting packages in the mail from my readers of muskox figurines. <laughs> Here's one of them. <laughs> I got Christmas ornaments of muskox and all kinds of things. It's, it's amazing. And just, uh, I don't know if you saw my Sunday strip last week or week before. I did a strip about, you heard of the product Kaboom? It's kind of a cleaner. I did a strip about Kaboom. And two days ago, I got a big box full of Kaboom products from, <laughs> from the Kaboom manufacturer. So I'm, I'm planning, you may watch for this, a strip about Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to see if anything happens. <laughs> I'll keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, how did that get there? Holy cow. You know, people ask me, do you ever deal in politics in your strip? And I say, absolutely not. Why would I do that? I mean, the minute you take one side in your comic strip, you're going to make half your readers hate you. And so I never do. And I'm not going to here either. This was, this was uh, given to me uh, by a secret source high in the White House. <laughs> I don't know. Came off the internet. But if you, if you look uh, behind President Obama's hand and uh, to the side of his hip, there's something very colorful there. I'll do, I got an enhanced image from the CIA I'll show you here. Close up. <laughs> it looks almost like it could be a comic strip, doesn't it? So we, we, we asked the CIA to, to do an enhanced satellite uh, version of it, and they and it came out still pretty fuzzy, but they, then they did a comparison to it, and, uh, and they found that it, it actually lines up to that exact uh, strip. So I did some research on that and found out the date it ran, and, and uh, it was this, this strip right here. I, it's not one of my funniest strips. It's about Opal and her, or her Opal's friend, Emily, in their garden, and, and uh, Emily uh, doesn't want Opal to pick her weeds because then she won't have anything to do tomorrow. But I think maybe they had this on the desk because uh, you know, Mrs. Obama has a, has a vegetable garden in the White House, so maybe that's why it was there. Anyway, I thought it was, uh, was kind of cool to see my work in the Oval Office anyway, whether you like the president or not. But you know, just so, so I know that I'm not all that important and I don't get on my high horse, there's this counterpoint to that. A couple of Christmases ago, my daughter was at the Meadowood Mall here in Reno, walking down through the stores, looks in one store window, it's a pet store, sees a parrot, <laughs> and there underneath the parrot is my comic strip. <laughs> so uh, from the White House, uh, Oval Office to the underneath the parrot, you know, that's, I run the gamut, but, uh, oh well. That's why it's nice to have books, because, you know, they, they stay around a little bit longer than, <laughs> than, you know, you never know where a strip's going to end up wrapping a fish or something. 
Anyway, we do have some books back there. It's titled, uh, How Come I Always Get Blamed for the Things I Do? I ask, my that, I ask myself that all the time. Why do I get blamed for the things I do? And if you read it, you might find yourself as thrilled and happy as these young ladies here. <laughs> that, that's how funny it is. <laughs> it's hilarious. Well, let me leave you with, uh, with one final strip before I take any questions you might have. Here, uh, they're at the pond throwing rocks in the water, and Nelson says, how long do you want to live, Grandpa? Oh, I don't know. Until I don't want to anymore, I guess. And Nelson says, well, I hope you live as long as you want to. And Earl says, I hope I want to as long as I live. <laughs> so that's my wish for you. May you live as long as you want to, and may you want to as long as you live. Thank you very much. And if you, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer those if I can, I, if we have time, I guess. Yes, sir. I grew up in uh, the Bay Area, one of those pr transplanted Californians, but I was born in Idaho, and we moved here from Idaho. But uh, cartooning, uh, doing a comic strip was something I dreamed of. When I was a kid, comic strips were, it was the golden age of comics. You know, I loved L Little Abner and, and Walt Kelly with his pogo and, and uh, all those, Terry and the Pirates, Dick Tracy, you know. And back then, the Sunday paper came, and, and the, the comics were wrapped around the outside of the paper like a like, uh, present, you know. And, and I would open that and read it with my dad. Or, and uh, it was just something I dreamed, wow. I, you know, because I, I, loved, I loved drawing. I thought, maybe I could do this someday. <laughs> um, as I got into high school, and you know, I, I, I never took any classes in drawing, but I was always drawing. And whenever there was a blank piece of paper, I was always drawing funny faces and things. But in high school, and I, when I had to start thinking, what am I going to do for a living? I just didn't think I was funny enough to come up with ideas for a comic strip. So I went into uh, commercial art. And I worked for ad agencies and magazine publishers and newspapers for years doing graphics and illustrations. But then I got to be about 40 years old and uh, kind of midlife crisis time, I guess. <laughs> Instead of buying a red Porsche, I, I decided to try a comic strip. And like I told you, I went through all that uh, thinking what I wanted to draw. Sent it in to uh, three different uh, syndicates, and uh, although there was some interest, they eventually all turned it down. And so at that point, I decided, well, I tried, and three strikes and you're out. Fortunately, that lady in the teal shirt in the back by the book table uh, wouldn't let me quit. <laughs> she kept saying, I'll send it in again. I, I, I knew she was wrong. I, I, I knew she was, you know, it was, it was a lost cause. But finally, after several months of her, what's the word? Nagging, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> just, to, just to prove her wrong, I sent it in one more time. And of course, you know, you know what happened there. <laughs> She's always right. And, uh, but if it hadn't been for her, it, it never would have gone, because I, I was convinced it, it wasn't worth pursuing. So that, that's, we started out in, in uh, 24 papers. Reno was one of the first papers that to sign it up. And uh, comic strip artists are paid, each paper pays so much a week to carry your strip and that fee is based on their circulation. So the, the bigger circulation, the more they pay you each week. And they pay you one fee for the Monday through Saturday. And then if they carry it Sunday, that's an equal fee to the rest of the week, too. So anyway, we have seven children. And so that's a lot of Cheerios to buy. So <laughs> I kept my day job for the first five years, would work in the, at, during the day at the ad agency, and then come home at night, work till midnight on the strip. So my wife was raising uh, seven kids as a, as a single parent, pretty much, you know, for for all those years, and so uh, uh, she put up with a lot uh, to get this uh, strip going, but uh, it's been worth it. So I, I always like to acknowledge her and, and, uh, and what she did. If you don't believe in yourself, you should be married to somebody who believes in you, I guess that's the lesson there. There's a hand way in the back there. Oh, <laughs> that's one where, yeah, I remember that one. That was a long time ago. Yeah, there was Opal, and she was uh, in the uh, freezer section. All you see is her rear end sticking out of the dairy case because she wants to get the, the, uh, the jug of milk with the, with the earliest date. So she's way back in the my, I actually took my wife to Smith's and had her pose for that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what a good wife she is, you know. How many of you wives would do that for your husband? <laughs> But uh, I don't have really a favorite. You know, that's like asking me which is my favorite child. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, to be truthful, you know, most of them I'm disappointed when I see them. They're never as funny as I think they're going to be. So, so uh, I'm usually disappointed with most of them. But uh, it's, so that's why it's nice to hear you laughing at some of them here. 
Anybody else have any? Uh, how about you? Okay, how far ahead, I mean, for the one that comes out tomorrow, when did you draw that? Probably about a month and a half ago. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I used to have to be farther ahead because they used to have to be mailed physically through through the U.S. Postal Service to Washington, D.C., to my editors. Then once they were approved and corrected, then they'd have to go out from there to papers all over in this country and in foreign countries. So it took a lot. Now that there's everything's emailed, so it's, it's just, you know, you can you can work closer to the deadline. You can, there's cartoonists who work, you know, like a week ahead or, or you know, like Doonesbury, he does topical issues, so he's like right on the cusp of the, of the current events. But... You know, I, I work, I don't like having that, uh, that close a deadline, so I try to work farther ahead. But it means like when, when, you, when we're having Halloween here, I'm trying to think of Christmas ideas, which, which makes it kind of difficult. <laughs> Any other hands? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, you know, yeah, I don't. I don't draw eyeballs usually in my strip, unless they have their glasses off, then I just draw a little dot there. But uh, in the beginning, the earliest strips, I actually did draw their, their pupils inside their glasses, and I just didn't like the way it looked. And uh, it, it, it uh, makes it hard sometimes to show expressions. You know, I can't show them squinting very hard or, or their, wise pop, their eyes popping open in surprise. So it, it limits my, my uh, able to portray expressions, because the, really the eyes are the most expressive part of your face, you know. But I just like the way they look. And, and I save a lot of ink that way, too, you know. <laughs> but, but uh, yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, he's, it, it's hard to say. Uh. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, well, it's available on the internet now. There are several sites where you can see my strip every day. It's on, I have a Facebook page, an official Facebook page. If you go there, you'll see it uh, in color every, every, every morning. Or you can go on gocomics.com or some other places too, but it's, it's available. But yeah, the, you're probably right, that's, they, that's probably the future, but no one's figured out a way, a compensation, a market uh, plan where, the, where the cartoonists can get paid and make a living doing it that way because most of the income comes from newspaper fees or, or selling books, <laughs> that kind of thing. But uh, maybe they'll figure it out one of these days. Yeah. Yes? What about the translations in foreign countries, she asks. Uh, most of my foreign papers appear in English. Uh, there have been a few that have been translated. I saw one in Japanese, one in Korean, and Spanish, and Portuguese. And my, uh, my hope always is that it's funny written in a different language than maybe it is in English. I know in, in Korea, when it was running there, that they, would, they left the English and they put the, the translation underneath it so that uh, people could see the pictures, see the English, and then see what it said in, in their own language. It was a good way to learn English. Uh, but by far, there's a lot of English-speaking papers in every country, all over the world. And so even in like, uh, I know I'm in Bahrain and Indonesia, but those are in English-speaking papers there. So I don't think it gets translated very much. So I'm trying to teach the whole world English is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, what, do, what is there to correct and what is there to edit? Well, in the beginning, I didn't show you one, but uh, sometimes when I speak, I show samples of my rejected strips. The very first strip I did that was rejected, it was one of the very first strips I'd ever drawn. It was Roscoe, and he's, uh, he's asleep in front of the TV set, and uh, all of a sudden, there's an exercise program on the TV, and it's a lady doing aerobics, and she's getting the viewers at home to, to, to do things. She says, come on, you viewers at home, let's go, let's go, and, and Roscoe wakes up, and and she says, let's go, lift those legs, lift those legs. And the Roscoe walks over to the TV and, and lifts his leg. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was told that uh, you can't show that in a, in a comic strip. <laughs> but you know what? Just a couple of weeks ago, I saw that in one of the strips in the Reno paper. There was a dog lifting its leg on a TV set. And so I think, I don't know if the times are changing. 
I have a favorite story about that. You know, well, there occasionally there are, you know, grammatical errors. I never, I'm always getting, I never can remember whether to put the, the uh, period inside the quotes or outside the quotes or different things like that. So, so they correct little nitpicky things like that or uh, once I spelled raccoon wrong, you know. <laughs> but uh, years ago, how are we doing on time, by the way? Are we running too late? Years ago, you've heard of Beetle Bailey? Uh, he tells a story in his, in his uh, biography called uh, Backstage at the Strip, how his editor never would let him draw belly buttons. But he would draw them anyway, and when they got to his editor, his editor would, would uh, take his little knife and trim around the belly button and peel it off. And uh, because that was considered, you know, crass, vulgar, crude to, sh to draw belly buttons, you know, people were, you know, Anyways, but he didn't throw it away. He would take the little belly button and put it in a little box, a little cigar box. <laughs> Every time he saw one, he'd peel it off, put it in the box. And uh, he, he actually labeled this box Beetle Bailey's Belly Button Box. <laughs> and, and he kept this going for I don't know how long, but uh, of course Mort Walker, the, the artist, didn't care for his art being mutilated like this. So one day, uh, he'd had enough. He drew a strip on the beach all the characters in swimsuits with belly buttons, every character showing their belly button. And then just to make his point, he had a big truck full of naval oranges driving onto the scene. <laughs> and uh, his editor said, point taken, and he said, you can draw belly buttons if you want. <laughs> and so, but, but truthfully, you know, if you look at comic strips, the, they do hold to a pretty high standard. You, you see things at eight o'clock on, on primetime <laughs> network TV that you won't see in a comic strip. And I kind of like that. I, I like, I like uh, keeping comic strips a family-friendly thing that you don't, you're not embarrassed having your grandkids read with you or something like that. So I don't try to push the envelope, even though I did try to get a dog peeing on a TV set one time. But <laughs> I've been mended my evil ways now. <laughs> yes, Olivia. It's around 800. Yeah, we, we've gone from 24 to 800. Uh, so that's that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, we're appreci I appreciate it. It's uh, we did just lose a group. We had we had over 800, 800 and something. But then there was a group uh, of newspapers that uh, a group of 30 papers that the for some reason the owner canceled pickles in all 30 papers all at once, which was kind of annoying. But uh, these things happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That yeah, was President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, during World War. After that. Yeah. after that, I don't remember who was after that. You know, I, I kind of miss those days. You know, uh, I, I worry that uh, you know, like my kids, I don't think any of them subscribe to the newspaper. And I don't even know if they know what newspapers are. But just two days ago, I spoke to a group of Girl Scouts, and they all claimed to read the newspaper. I was really encouraged. <laughs> Here's 12-year-old girls that that are familiar with comic strips and, and read newspapers. So maybe there's, maybe I won't be uh, uh, working at a McDonald's <laughs> as soon as I thought I might be. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's, it's uh, you know, you don't, you don't know what, I remember uh, reading about how when TV came on, you know, television was invented, people said, well, the movies are history. No one's going to make motion pictures. If you got TV, you know, you can watch it free, you know. Movies survive. Maybe maybe newspapers will survive. Who knows? We'll we'll see. Uh, I hope so. I, I, I for me, I could read it on the on the uh, internet, but I like getting ink on my fingers and having it over my bowl of oatmeal in the morning. So uh, so that's that's just part of uh, the way I like to read the paper. <laughs> you guys have been a wonderful crowd. I thank you so much for your uh, for your coming here today and for your your kind uh, comments and everything. And and I'll uh, see you guys in the funny papers. Okay.